So if we move on to early implant placement, I've mentioned this already. One of the reasons why you might delay the implant placement at the time of extraction is if there is infection. So you want that infection to resolve. And how many times have you taken out a tooth and you've come back six or eight weeks later and there's still something going on, hasn't quite completely healed. So sometimes we cannot clear the infection just by taking out the tooth. Now with an early implant placement approach, you can tell absolutely if the infection has resolved because you will see clinical signs of health and healing. And if there's still a residual infection, of course, you can manage it. So if in doubt, I would adopt an early implant placement protocol to allow resolution of that inflammation. And I would also choose this in the soft, uh, in the thin soft tissue phenotypes, particularly the thin phenotypes where if you leave uh, the, the site to heal for a period of six to eight, 10 weeks, then there is a spontaneous thickening of the soft tissues. And this was beautifully demonstrated in a study by Vivian Chapui, a cone beam CT study measuring the change in the thickness of the soft tissues. And with the thin bone phenotypes, particularly with, with the facial bone undergoing resorption, the thickening of the soft tissue was, was very substantial, up to seven times um, greater thickness uh, compared to the pre-extraction uh, situation. And this is great advantages for us because we are able to change a thin phenotype case into a thick phenotype case, which then has very significant implications for maintaining soft tissue stability and good aesthetics um, for, for over the long term. So this is one of the, I think one of the biggest advantages in the aesthetic area of going to an early implant placement protocol spontaneous increase in soft tissue volume that mother nature gives to you. Now, when you take a tooth out and you allow a period of time for healing to take place in that early time frame, as we mentioned, there is already a flattening of the ridge due to that initial resorption. But that facial resorption leading to the flattening of the ridge gives us space then to reconstruct the original contour of the ridge with our bone grafting and GBR procedures. You see, now we, are, we can graft over the surface of the existing bone. If you have an immediate extraction site in a convex um, extraction socket, it's impossible to graft particulate grafting material onto the facial aspect. But in an early implant placement approach, we can do that. We can say, well, we don't worry about the facial bone. Let it resorb. We will replace it with the biomaterial. So that's the approach that's taken with an early implant placement approach. And this is just a clinical example. Uh, an implant placed eight weeks after extraction. You can see uh, on the image a residual socket defect was there and now we have a dehiscence of the, of the implant. The implant's contained well within the, uh, the bone walls. Then according to the technique described by Danny Boozer in 2008, autogenous bone chips locally harvested are used to graft over any part of the, the implant surface itself because this will rapidly integrate with the, with the implant and these are large chips of bone. And then subsequently the GBR procedure with your bone substitute to overbuild this. And notice how this healing abutment, which is four millimeters in length, with the GBR procedure, the graft is taken right on top of the healing abutment to increase the height of the, um, of the, the crest of, of the ridge. So we're trying to reconstruct this coronal to the implant abutment interface. And then the barrier membrane techniques, primary closure, and so on. So this is the uh, the same case now following completion. It's uh, the the tooth is the right central incisor, and you can see from an occlusal point of view that uh, we've been able to achieve good contour of the ridge and the reconstruction of the ridge with the GBR procedure. Remember, there was a dehiscence of the on the surface of the implant at the time it was placed. So this is now completely regenerated uh, and replicated in the biomaterial, the bone substitute. And this is verified on the CBCT. And this is a three year outcome. And you can see clearly a thick, a new thick facial bone. This is reconstructed bone uh, has been created. Uh, and studies have shown that this is on average about 1.5 millimeters in thickness. And importantly, you'll see that um, the dotted line illustrates the interface between the implant itself and the abutment uh, and the bone crest, the new bone crest is now coronal to this. So you can reconstruct the bone coronal to the original implant abutment interface. And then the soft tissues then form, we have three millimeters of soft tissue height, which is your biologic width. So we have a situation which should remain stable 
for a long period of time. There's no reason why the soft tissue should recede on a case like this because not only have we reconstructed the, the bone, but the reconstructed bone is thick and the dimensions of the soft tissue are consistent with the biologic width of soft tissues around dental implants. Now, delaying it further though, as a type three placement is sometimes indicated in the maxillary anterior region where you have extended apical defects and you're concerned that you cannot get primary stability of the implant at the time the implant's placed. And this is a good example, a, a right central incisor that's got uh, a large apical area around it. And uh, it's very uncertain whether after eight weeks, 10 weeks, you'll be able to uh, place the implant. You might have to give cases like this uh, additional time to heal. But here is the, the downside. In maxillary anterior sites, the longer we leave this, the more external resorption of the ridge from the facial takes place. So whilst we might get healing internally and bone fill to allow the implants to be placed with stability, we at the same time we're getting the external resorption, which may make it impossible to place an implant. So cases like this may end up having to go for a staged bone grafting procedure. So sometimes cases with extended defects are better off grafted um, for ridge preservation at an earlier time point rather than waiting um, for longer periods of time uh, in case of uh, significant resorption like this. And of course, this is a judgment call that we as clinicians have to make when we are assessing our cases. There are no clear guidelines for this, but you know it, it relies on clinical experience and clinical intuition. So early implant placement can be indicated whether the soft tissue phenotype is thin or thick. If it's thin, it spontaneously thickens. If it's thick, it stays thick. If we have damage to the facial bone, where um, sorry, if the facial bone is thin or thick, it also doesn't matter with an early implant placement approach. And it also doesn't matter whether the facial bone is intact or damaged because the protocol uh, allows for grafting over the surface of whatever remaining bone there is on the facial aspect of the ridge, so it's completely reconstructed. And therefore, the early implant placement approach has a broad case selection criteria, which means that if you're, if you're trying to select the right case uh, for the right time frame, you almost cannot get it wrong if you adopt an early implant placement approach because it works with all the different clinical criteria that I've mentioned to you. And from my perspective then, early implant placement, we should regard this as the default option when it comes to the timing of implant placement for replacement of teeth in the maxillary anterior region.